thank you so much for letting us come and do this interview with you. Um, I thought it would be really useful for the listeners to start with if we could just get um, a background of how you got into teaching and your journey through teaching so far. So I started, my first year of teaching was 1986 mm -hmm. um, and I went, I was appointed in a secondary school in Barnsley as a science slash biology teacher. Mm -hmm. um, I was really passionate about my subject, really interested in the subject matter. Um, and I think I found, I was a little bit disappointed because I just thought that the children would be just as interested as I was. And obviously it's part of the teacher's role is to engage and enthuse the children, which I, I, I knew that, but I thought they would naturally be enthused. Uh, and I think, you know, I then had, a, I got married, I had a family, I went part time. But then I had an opportunity to move because uh, I was living in Bradford and the journey was um, becoming a bit of, it was becoming harder. So I moved. So where was it you based then? I was in Barnsley. Barnsley, right. So travelling to Barnsley every day. And so I moved to a school in Bradford um, and it was a totally different school. It was a middle school, so the children were just a bit younger. Um, so an opportunity to teach a broader range of things to the children and I just really enjoyed it getting to know the children more uh, I'd always been thinking oh you know if you've got the children every every day all day every day that would be really hard but actually I, I really enjoyed that side of it um, there were a lot of um, English with additional language learners so that was a real challenge to me because I had not experienced that before um, and so the strategies that you then have to start thinking about make a lot of sense to you know any learner but we we had to employ those strategies really to engage the addition to make it easier for them to access what we were trying to teach so paraphrasing and speaking very clearly and uh, lots of repetition tasks and things like that, putting things in different orders, looking at the language as well as the subject content, uh, you know, so those strategies were really important and I think they are important anyway really, they, they serve teachers well but you know it was one of those things that we really had to think about. Um, <clears throat> I loved teaching at, at that middle school uh, but then Bradford uh, underwent a restructure and they effectively got rid of middle schools and so um, a, an opportunity came up in, an, in a, a neighbouring authority in Kirklees um, and I was successfully appointed as the leader of science in that particular school, another middle school. Very different though because the, it was a much more affluent area um, which didn't have, uh, there, were, there were very few EAL learners so again a change of approach you know um, but again I really enjoyed it um, and I think every school I've taught at there's been something to get your teeth into and it was outdoor learning there a bit adventurous um, outdoor learning so I used to lead the children and we, we used to go to the lake districts and and we did things like climbing and uh, canoeing things like that which was really good and again as part of a an outward bound experience you get the children the children get to know you on a different level and you get to know them on a different level which was really really interesting um but i really i think that was where i um found that you know i was questioning things and why is that why why that decision and uh and i thought well you know some i, I did um, have a word with one of my leaders and he, he said well maybe it's time that you started thinking about your own leadership journey and that's the point at which I applied to move into um, uh, more leadership position I mean I had been a leader there but you know more clearly defined leadership role so I became the assistant head of primary school in Bradford really enjoyed that and that as my first primary um, school I loved it just as, you know, in the same way that I liked the move from secondary to middle and teaching more children for more of the time and different subjects. That I just thought, well, why haven't I done this all the time? Because I really ha enjoyed having my own class. I can remember being really, really worried about, oh my goodness, I've got to get these year six children through their SATs in their English. 
but it just, uh, you know, I've, I've got a love of teaching English that I didn't know I'd had at the time and um, it, I just loved it. Um, but I also loved the opportunity to lead different strategies across school for school improvement. Um, the it, assessment for learning was high on the agenda at the time and that became my little baby there and so we did an awful lot in terms of um, developing whole school strategies to support assessment for learning um, so that children, uh, it was more about um, the adults engaging with the child and making it accessible for their learning rather than children should just be expected to learn and I think that's been a bit of a shift um, certainly in, from when I started back in 1986 to now, it, that, the, the there's def been a definite shift in that direction. Uh, and from there, um, I applied and became the deputy head in, a pr in another primary school, um, at which I then became the head as well. So I, I, I look back now and think, well, I really started that job as soon as I was appointed as the deputy, because I was so t the, the head was, um, she, she clearly had the intention to retire and left me to do an awful lot of things, um, you know, that um, I, pra I think, you know, to put it bluntly, you know, she was grooming me for the headship position, uh, helping me to learn the craft of headship by letting me um, undertake all these different responsibilities. And that was, again, re another really interesting school back into the realms of EAL and dis huge disadvantaged uh, population in terms of uh, poverty, etc. but rich in terms of, you know, character, personality um, uh, and what have you. So another really, really, in <coughs> excuse me, another really, really interesting school. Um, a lot of um, child protection work to be done there and that was a really huge eye-opener. I saw things that I thought actually this doesn't really happen to children um, until I went to that school and then you know you realise actually there are children who, you know in, in the city that you've lived in all your life that do suffer these awful things and that was a big eye-opener. Um, not the pleasantest side of the job but you know ne nevertheless an eye-opener so a lot of time spent on that as well and then obviously um, I became the head and it at the point at which I became the head I think the local authority had been waiting until the head retired and then they literally pounced it felt like they'd just pounced on me and Liz, you need to do this, that's not good enough, what about this, what about that, what about the other? And so it was, we really, I, I felt that I really was sort of um, in the deep end, if you like. And again, it was something that I really relished. Um, and I don't look back and think, oh, that was dreadful. I look back really fondly. They were very exciting times. You know, some people think, you know, with that pressure, you know people buckle don't they and you know I'm not here to say whether that's right or wrong but I just really relished the opportunity and tried to just grab it and get on with it anyway as part of um, what we were doing in school and um, in the Easter holidays I, I took a party of children to Turkey uh, on an exchange visit it was part of a, a group of um, about seven schools across Europe and that went really well, and we were due to come home. And um, the ash cloud, I don't know if you remember, but um, in 2010, a volcano in Iceland erupted and there was this big ash cloud and it virtually ground all air traffic to a standstill. So we were stuck in Turkey for a week. And the children were, looking back, they were so good. We, we got a bit of a, a regime going. We had a bit of, you know, we did have some lesson time and then, um, we'd take them to the park and being twinned with a school we actually went into their school as well so in some ways it was so good because we saw the re what a real child in Turkey would experience rather than it being a planned visit where we go on these excursions and go here and go there and we meet the children but in a bit of a false environment uh, they did see what how real children in Turkey go to school and what they experience 
so that was a real positive but the children obviously thinking were away from mummy and daddy for a week they were a little bit homesick um there was limited contact um with the parents we had to, we we kept in contact through school one of the things we felt very strongly about was that if we let the children ring home that would make things perhaps worse so we did keep in contact through school but nevertheless i think we were all heaving a huge sigh of relief when we got to find that we were on a flight that saturday no more than me because in in my absence um school the summer term had started again and ofsted had called um now in those days and i say in those days it's only um nine years ago but um you got the call and then you got a couple of days in between. So they'd, they'd called on the Friday and they were coming on the Tuesday. So I hopped off the plane on the Saturday morning after being overnight really traveling and um, just rushed into school. It was, a, it was, the feeling was as though I was a new mum and my baby had been taken away from me. It was a really, really stressful experience. But um, it, it, the Ofsted inspection went better than we could have hoped and um, it was a we didn't get a good inspection but it was in again in those days satisfactory which were, and we'd fully been expecting to have to um, go into a category so that that was a good experience and it was it was really good for me as a, as a new head because it charted it was like a marker really for me about all the work that we had done in about three months and then our journey forwards so that was that was really good from there i became um this the school became an academy um and um i, I and i then came to thornton primary in 2014 as a consultant head um and then applied for the substantive position and got that so i've been here ever since so you mentioned so then I started that you my first year of teaching was um, 1986 and obviously it was um, quite a number of and years I went, ago. I was and I was just wondering how is EAL teaching as a science do you think changed slash biology teacher um, in comparison to um, now and sort of in I was the really 90s passionate about them, really, really interested in the subject the differences matter. You know, is there and I think I found I was a little bit disappointed because I just thought um, that the children would be just as interested as I was and obviously it's part of the teacher's role is to engage and enthuse the children which I, 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 I knew that but I thought they would naturally be enthused uh, and I think you know I then had a I got married I had a family I went part-time but then I had an opportunity to move because uh, I was living in Bradford and the journey was um, becoming a bit of it was becoming harder so I moved I was in Barnsley so traveling to Barnsley every day and so I moved to a school in Bradford um, and it was a totally different school it was a middle school so the children were just a bit younger um, so an opportunity to teach a broader range of things to the children and I just really enjoyed it getting to know the children more uh, I'd always been thinking oh you know if you've got the children every every day all day every day that would be really hard but actually I, I really enjoyed that side of it um, there were a lot of um, English with additional language learners so that was a real challenge to me because I had not experienced that before um, and so the strategies that you then have to start thinking about make a lot of sense to you know any learner but we we had to employ those strategies really to engage the addition to make it easier for them to access what we were trying to teach so paraphrasing and speaking very clearly and uh, lots of repetition tasks and things like that putting things in different orders looking at the language as well as the subject content uh, you know so those strategies were really important and I think they are important anyway really they, they serve teachers well but you know it was one of those things that we really had to think about um, <coughs> I loved teaching at, at that middle school uh, but then Bradford 
uh, underwent a restructure and they effectively got rid of middle schools and so um, a, an opportunity came up in, an, in a local, a neighbouring authority in Kirklees um, and I was successfully appointed as the leader of science in that particular school, another middle school. Very different though because the, it was a much more affluent area um, which didn't. But obviously you mentioned being stranded abroad in Turkey with children I mean I just cannot imagine um, how did you how did you support everybody so you'd have had to support the children you'd have had to support the staff that you were with I mean how did you sort of hold that all together and how did the children and the parents react so uh, it, it was tricky um, the the children had come from two schools there were very small groups of children we had eight children in total and the staff even though i would have thought what a fantastic opportunity because it was the easter holidays um it was really only the leadership that we could um coerce to come uh, so we had uh, leaders from the two schools including myself and um the children and so keeping the staff morale wasn't really a problem you know um, but the children we we had a regular routine in place they had learning every morning we commandeered a section the hotel were fantastic they let us have a room in the hotel just to do a bit of writing and what have you every morning we went obviously we, with it being in Turkey the weather had started to pick up for the summer so we were able to spend time in the park in the afternoon we were able to go to the school and the children had made friends with the children there so generally speaking I look back and I think well I can't think of the times where we had lots of problems um, but uh, there were times when the children just wanted to get back to mum and dad and what have you and thank goodness we didn't have to deal with the parents who I'm sure were more anxious maybe even than the children because it's a you know they just didn't know what was going on um, and, th and that was difficult but thankfully that was being dealt with by staff back at school so all in all I look back and I think well what an exciting adventure <laughs> right then so another thing um, then so you've talked about becoming um, an academic twice throughout your career. Um, so in terms of budget, so obviously that is um, a big topic in education mm. at the moment. How did you find um, that the budgets were different um, when you were in a local authority school and also in an academy? The difference in the funding that you get is really insignificant. Um, Certainly the way that it's managed is different. It's a different financial year, so it's September. It's, the, it's in line with the academic year, which is in some case, you know, a lot of things, for a lot of things that's much easier to manage the money uh, from that side of things. But then if you're buying into authority services, they still run from April to April, so, but it, 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 it's negligible really, the, the difficulty. Um, now at Thornton Primary School we're part of Focus Trust and um, we pay a corporate support fee of 5% of our uh, GAG which is the funding that you get per pupil um, but out of that we get an awful lot more support than we would have done with the local authority because just, the support just isn't there. So we have a school improvement partner who visits school regularly um, undertakes a range of different things. Um, we have um, uh, six consultancy days a year which we can choose so we look at our school priorities and think well that would be really good to have some input uh, for CPD in terms of, of that particular thing so you know this person will be able to come and deliver that to our staff. Um, we have um, times where the teachers are invited uh, to meet together in certain year groups so they meet in the schools across the trust to do moderation uh, and to have input in terms of English and maths curriculum so all in all we get much more support um, which really negates the corporate support fee that we actually pay um, but in terms of um, the funding it's exactly the same it just comes from a different a different place really.
So what are the knock-on pressures then of a dwindling budget? Because obviously the budget's not technically going down, but they are technically going down. Um, and what are the pressures um, sort of associated with that? Well, we um, foretold this oh, four or five years ago. There were, you know, there were big red flags flying about budgets. You know, those messages were coming through clear, uh, clear and strong from the DfE. And so we were able to be a bit proactive and think about that in, in, in terms of our forecasting for the future. Uh, we've had, we've undergone two restructures in those four years. I think we thought the first time we did it, and it was quite a drastic restructuring of staff, we lost a, sig a significant number of support staff. I think it was 16. Um, and we thought that would actually keep us you know keep the wolf from the door if you like uh, we've undergone another restructure very recently in which we've lost one of our senior leaders our deputy head has been made redundant um, and still um, our forecast is showing that th there are very tricky times ahead um, so the actual impact is that children it, it's on children at the end of the day I could say that it's on staff but when you knock that down further, the, the impact is on children. Um, and I listened, actually, because it's something, obviously, that is very dear to my heart. You know, I, I would love to be able to say, yes, have another couple of support staff in that year group or there or there. So it's something quite close to my heart. And I noticed that it was being debated in Parliament on uh, it back in March. And I just Googled. I thought, oh, I wonder how that went. And I did Google it. And... It's, a, it's when I found out you can actually download transcripts of things that, are, you know, any bills that are heard in Parliament, etc., any um, discussions that are had. And everything was very, very positive in terms of, you know, we must do something about this uh, funding crisis that schools are experiencing. But right at the end, um, it was cut short almost by um, a politician that came in and said, well... Um, school outcomes are going up and um the, the, you know the impact is is not there therefore um you know schools the, the line that we keep being fed is funding has never been better for schools um and then he he sort of said well you know um the outcomes are going up as well so there's obviously not a problem and I just thought well that is because the teaching profession and staff who work in schools are so dedicated we're dealing with children who are the most vulnerable section of our population if you like and they won't let them fail so staff are just working harder to cover for the absence of other staff that can't be there because of you know the budgets have been cut um, for resources that aren't there, um, for, for a number of, you know, for social services that aren't there anymore. Um, and um, and they do, and, and the workload for staff has increased in line with the dwindling budgets. Yeah. So do you think then that schools spend their budgets effectively? I don't think schools have a choice but to spend their budgets effectively. And um, obviously we have a business manager who, um, you know, that's her, her role. But she does that in conjunction with me and other members of the leadership team. Um, th there aren't many sort of questions about, oh, would, wouldn't it be nice to do this strategy? Where can we find the money to do that? It's more about... Have we got enough money to keep the staffing in place? Uh, we know that we've got children coming in with needs and we might need extra staff to do this, that or the other. Uh, have we got enough money to do that? Uh, we can see that there are developing needs in XYZ year groups. Have we got enough money to, further, to, to add additional staff in there to support the children's needs or resources or employ external agencies? And the answer now is going to be no, but it would be about playing around with different um, pots in the budget so that we can actually, it's prioritising really, so that we can actually look at, well, is it really important to have this member of staff and how 
would we be able to do it? What else? But something would have to be cut. We've got to the point where um, we schools um, run on a system whereby we can show an in-year surplus or deficit and then that carries forward into um, an overall surplus or deficit. Well, at the moment, our We've, our overall is in surplus, but we're, we're from next year we're looking, we're forecasting an in-year deficit, and after that, it's what are we going to do? So my business manager keeps coming to me, and and she's saying, well, um, can we vertically group these classes in across year four and five? And so I'm saying, well, that's not really um, something that would be ideal at all because the children are just so, they're at different stages of their education, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but it's something that we're being asked to do. She Obviously, she's got that pressure coming uh, above from our um, financial lead within the trust. Uh, and then he's got the pressure from uh, the Education and Funding Agency who are basically saying schools must not return negative budgets. Uh, or deficit budgets, should I say. So his hands are tied, but while schools are returning budgets that are in surplus, the government has a stronger argument to say There's, everything's okay. But what they don't see are all the cuts that we're having to make and all the choices that we're having to make and the impact that it's having on the children. And the interesting thing that um, I sort of picked up on your answer there was that you didn't really talk about anything other than staff. So it's all about staff. So then you've got to think about where the other things come from yes. because schools don't just run on staff. No. You know, there's the building, there's the lighting, um, you know, there's the resources, but there's yeah. the resources that you can't scrape on, like the books and the pencils and things. Um, yet, obviously, it's got down to, I would say, the most important thing where you're deliberating over whether you can have a member of staff to yeah. support a child or not. And that's because staffing is the biggest percentage of the budget fixed costs like the electricity, the water, things like that, we have to pay. But the staffing accounts for 75% roughly of the budget. And really, um, if we're going to make any savings, that's the only place that we can look because other things are so negligible in comparison. They're still real costs, but they form up such a small percentage of the budget that the, the only real saving is to look at staffing. I think we've paired everything back and it is quite worrying really about what's going to happen over the next few years because we just don't know what else there is to cut on. You know, you know we've made some really seriously, um, really serious decisions in terms of what we can afford going forwards. And we, you know, like recently we've, we've lost our deputy head and actually, uh, those are last resort kind of things and and yet we're still being i've been asked to put a plan together to show how we're going to um steer our way through the next few years without presenting a deficit budget well the only thing we can do is look at staffing because that's the biggest proportion of the budget so you've talked about um staffing issues uh, with the budget so what's the knock-on effect then um, for children with additional needs right well often the needs can be met quite easily um, you know children who come to school in the morning who just need that bit of TLC you know we can, we can sort that out when they come to school a meet and greet and, it, and they feel safe and the, they can settle into their learning but some children don't settle in the same way. Um, for instance, um, you know, we've had a few children who need more of an alternative curriculum. And when it comes to the point where the children don't engage with other children, um, we're looking really at quite severe and complex needs. Um, obviously, we talk to parents. Um, and try and glean as much information as we can. We try to support parents as much as we can. We try to help, you know, we try to glean their support for, for, for us as well. You know, we're doing this, but this didn't seem to work. What, what else could we do? The teachers obviously plan for those additional needs in terms of learning and pastoral care. But there comes a point uh, beyond which we have limited resources. I mean, in terms of adult support, um, 
that's very expensive, obviously, and uh, something that we struggle to put in place or we put it in place at the expense of other children. Um, obviously, in, in the long term, we would try to look for a more suitable place maybe for those children or engage um, more suitable external support. But where that's not available, um, where we're really struggling to meet the needs of the children of the children that um, you know this, and it is a it is um, a small number of children but that nevertheless it can be um the, it can have a significantly disruptive effect on the teaching of everybody else because we're having to take from the children who need that support as well but maybe this child um, is demanding it you know on a, on a different level so it's a very very fine um, it's a balancing act really because we've paired as, as you can appreciate we've paired our staffing back so far that we're not able um, to meet the needs of, of very complex uh, and severe um, difficulties that some children are presenting with so as a company, uh, we're running a life work balance campaign. So it's something that's really important to me. Um, so in your school, how do you tackle that just <laughs> impossible problem of life work balance? Well, as you can probably understand from what I've said, um, shortage of staff means that uh, other staff will just, they're so committed, they will not let the children down that the bottom line is you know we will keep going and you know work harder and what have you however school has committed as as much as it, it's something that i feel very strongly about in terms of being able to say i tried my best you know if i can look back and think that i've tried my best for the children for the staff um then i'll, I'll you know i'll be happy and so um We've tried uh, a number of things. I mean, we've, we have CPD days, training days throughout the year. One of the things with, that we did this year was to have more of an engaging and fun aspect to it. Um, so we, um, we had a happiness day whereby um, we had somebody who came to train us, uh, Jeanette Bassamwood. Um, she's just really funny. And she uses her... She draws on her experience as a teacher to tell really funny anecdotes that you can all identify with. And it just makes you reflect and think a little bit more positively, perhaps. Uh, everybody, the feedback was really good anyway. Um, and so CPD is really important. Um, we've tried to put in um, a system whereby people who, staff who are leading extracurricular activities could maybe uh, have a day off. So they would, um, over a half term, where they lead uh, six sessions, perhaps, of, of something after school, um, where it's convenient, we can give them a day off. Um, just, to, just every little helps, really. Um, we've look, we, ha we try to have a happiness injection in every staff meeting um, so that staff are reminded you know to be positive and to look on the positive side and to learn to laugh really you know to have a laugh together um, and it doesn't always work but we we feel that it's important that we do maintain that positivity where we can and um, certainly in terms of the um, tasks that are we ask our teachers to do we're mindful really of things like that in terms of extra paperwork or admin or whatever. The trust are mindful of that as well, so they've tried to reduce the number of uh, times per year when we collect data, which needs inputting into the system, and to trust teachers more, because they do a great job and they're very professional um, to, to, you know, they've got a handle on that. You can tell when you speak to them, they've got a handle on the data they, because they know the children. And so to trust that rather than to input data all the time and to monitor that, you know. Um, and at the end of the day though, there's, there's not a lot that we can do in terms of our reduced staffing to, um, to alleviate 
the problems that are going to be created for other people. Um, I've taken an awful lot more on. Um, so has my other, de we had two deputies, so has my other deputy and other leaders within school. Um, you know, just so that that doesn't filter down too, too much. Um, we're looking at writing some summary reports for the summer. We've done our annual report, which staff um, worked to do that. Uh, so we're looking at more of a mail merge so that they're not having to write out um, a, a list of reports, basically, that they can, it, it can be a very quick job. They just have to fill a spreadsheet in with some uh, words, really, in terms of good, bad, you know, that, that kind of thing, so that they're not asked to be, asked to write yet another report. Um, and that's another reason why we um, bring the annual report forward, it's so that it can coincide with parents' evening, uh, so that we don't have to have another parents' evening as well. We, and we feel it's a more timely time, but that was another consideration in terms of having the annual report earlier in the year as well. So we do try to think of the little things that we can do, but we also recognise that teaching is um, its a time-consuming profession um, and, and that teachers also, you know, we, we try to coach and make sure that teachers manage that work-life balance as well so that they are making time for themselves. Uh, maybe I, when I was a teacher, I used to uh, leave one day a weekend free um, I used to like that to be Sunday, so get everything out of the way on a Saturday as much as I could, even if that meant getting the children to bed uh, and working on a Saturday night. You know, I know it's not everybody's cup of tea working on a Saturday night, but it meant that I had my Sundays free. And I think everybody has their own uh, way of managing that. So we do try, if somebody's really struggling, to sort of sit down and do a bit of a plan. Do you think now then, that you have enough staff members in school, um, and if you don't, how do you how do you keep that running? Yeah, the answer is no. Um, for instance, um, next year I we're expecting Ofsted, and I've argued with my business manager that we need to keep an ex an extra teacher for next year that we weren't going to have in the budget, but my assistant heads need some release time. Um, so that they can lead and, you know, um, help us to move, to carry on moving forward. It's an important time. Um, no, on another level, um, because the number of children that need our support. So I've got, in each mini key stage, if you like, so year five and six together, there's six classes. Year three and four together are six classes. I've got four additional um, members of staff so that doesn't mean that means that there isn't enough of one per class um, one of those members of staff is um, a behavior member of the behavior support team so they will and I don't want you to think by that that we've got lots of challenging behavior and they need to wade in and like the strong arm and sort it out it's about supporting those children who uh, are vulnerable or unhappy or, um, you know, for whatever reason, it might be something for a longer term or it might just be something in the short term, like the cat died or something like that. But it's very real to the children and it's about supporting those needs and that's where we're really short. So you can imagine when it comes to supporting learning, because we have to support those needs before the children can even think about learning. So then when we come to support the learning needs, it it's really difficult because um, there, aren't, there aren't any staff left at the end of the day. Um, and so planned interventions where we would uh, group children together who perhaps had not achieved a specific objective in the learning, um, we can plan them, but invariably they don't happen because of a shortage of staff. So I think the answer to that question is no. Um, but I don't, again, it's a difficult one um, to solve because we, we can't employ more staff <laughs> and we just have to manage. And we are managing really, really well, but I do worry about the future. So 
I know that this is not something that's possible, but if you could do anything, how would you personally solve the life work balance problem um, for, for all teachers in the UK? Uh, what teachers tell me more about is in this school is about uh, having the support from other adults. So in doing the display, so they're not staying behind after school to do the display, so there are adults that can be working alongside. Uh, that's not something we can even think about at the moment with the shortage of staff that we've got. It does happen, but not regularly. Um, and it's those little extra jobs that mean that teachers are then just taking home what the, and obviously we recognise that teachers do work at home and we can't get away from that, but it would be um, those really important jobs that they have to do, um, whereas they can come to school then and think, well, my classroom's going to be tidy, it's going to be attractive, I know that that learning display's been done, um, etc. Um, that I think that would make a big difference to the teachers here. In terms of the things that they do take home, obviously we've tried, oh, one of the things we have done here is um, to um, completely change our feedback policy so that we don't have lots of written comments in books now. Uh, we do it through highlighting or verbal feedback in the classroom, uh, but we've really cut down on the written feedback that we give um, to the children. Um, and obviously that has reduced, um, you know, the, they don't have to take lots of books home to pour over and write all the comments all over. They still have to be marked, but in a different way. But in terms of other things that uh, would reduce their workload, um, the, again, the data, would, we're looking at reducing that so they don't have to think about, um, you know, inputting that too often. Uh, but if, the, you know, by the government recognising that teachers know their children, they are professional, they've been trained to do the job. Um, I understand that schools are accountable, but um, we don't do less well when we take the pressure off. We, we are accountable, but we feel that accountability ourselves. Um, and one of the things that I think would greatly reduce teacher stress is for the government to actually acknowledge that um, and so that we don't have these measures that are always in place and, you know, which would have a knock-on effect with the press because the press love, it's not just the teaching profession, the press love to make the most of a bad situation and, and, and that's what sells newspapers and I understand that. But... Um, a change in direction which is led by the government would really make a big difference, I think, to the teaching profession. Um, so those are just a few things off the top of my head. So money in school is obviously really precious. Um, what was the number one thing that you spent money on uh, last school year that you can tell us about that was really, really effective? Well, staffing is the highest percentage of the budget, but I'll talk about something different. Um, and we received some funding into school through the Opportunities Area funding, which Bradford is part of, and it came under Educational Life Skills funding. So it was ring-fenced. We had to spend it on something that would make a difference to the children or to a group of children um, and not to be part of the curriculum or spent on staff, you know, anything like that. So I decided, first of all, after I'd had my little stamp and paddy about, you know, I could employ another TA with that, um, I thought, right, okay. And we spent it on outdoor learning. So every child in the school has had the opportunity to experience two days of outdoor learning with a company, um, you know, an external company. And the teachers have had uh, professional development in leading outdoor learning as well. And looking back, it's been a wonderful opportunity. I'm so pleased now that we got the money. And I know I complained at the beginning um, about, you know, well, I just need extra staffing. 
but it's been a fantastic opportunity to develop something within school that, that the children absolutely love. They get so excited. Um, there's an awful lot of learning that can be done through it. You know, um, they're outside in the woods and, you know, they've been up to Ogden Water um, in the summer term for, for some learning. So that's just one example that I can give you of learning of money that I think has been really well spent and will have a big impact on uh, the children's well-being and I think actually um, their learning you know and the data that we have because they're happy doing that and it engages them so they're more likely to remember things and to have that experience that they can write about perhaps or um, yeah I'm really pleased uh, about how I've spent that money. Excellent. Okay. Right. I've got some quick fire questions for you now. These are fun, aren't they? Um, okay. So who was your favourite teacher at school and why? I had two favourite teachers. Uh, one was Sister Evelyn and she was my teacher for RE and I just thought she was marvellous. She was very animated. You know, she would be uh, the teacher that if you were sitting on the front row, you'd get your head knocked off because she was, you know, she was so animated. But she was just so positive. And um, I think, you know, for a, a girl in, in her teenage years, her, she was a really good role model. Um, and then Miss Murray, who taught me chemistry, um, I really looked up to her. She was very inspiring. Uh, she was a very strong teacher and, and a strong person as well. So, yeah, they were my two favourite teachers. Thank you. Um, what do you wish you'd known when you first started out in teaching that you know now? I think, um, when I think back, and I think I've alluded to this as part of what I've been talking about, um, I wish that I had appreciated, maybe not known, but appreciated that um, what you're interested in um, isn't going to be the same as what the children are interested in. So I started off teaching biology. It was a subject that I was really passionate about. But actually, the greatest joy that I've had from teaching is uh, when I've had children in my own class and I've taught them everything and it didn't really matter and it's ignited passions that I didn't know I had you know before like history and um, an English as well uh, and an appreciation of the English language and I wish I'd realized that it's part of probably my own naivety but I wish I'd realized that when I started teaching because um, I think I would perhaps have started out in primary education rather than in secondary. Okay, so what are the three biggest changes you've seen in education during your teaching career? Um, the national curriculum, and I think we're going a bit full circle on that now because it was um, very, very free and um, when I first started teaching. In secondary it was different, but from primary colleagues who I've spoken to it was very um, topic based and you know um, no restrictions that kind of um, thing whereas and now it's it's going a little bit more in that direction but I think the national curriculum has helped us to think about what's important and what knowledge we, we need the children to know and the skills that they need to develop so it's been a good um, something that needed to happen um, so we've sort of gone up and we're coming back down the other side of the hill now. SATs, so we didn't have SATs, either when I was at, at school or when I first started teaching. I can remember them coming in in the early 90s, I think it was. Uh, so that's a big difference. Um, and the accountability that comes with that as well. Uh, there's been increasing pressure on schools to be accountable for data, I think. Um, as I've gone through my career and it, and some of that's right actually you know um, pupil premium although in some respects we are acknowledging that some children come from more disadvantaged backgrounds but schools haven't necessarily had any more it's been a sort of an in and an out uh, and this section of your budget is going to be about pupil premium um, I think there are three quite big things that have happened. 
So where do you think education is going to go in the next 10 years? Well, we always hope that it's not going to change again drastically. And I do think that um, Amanda Spielman and the new Ofsted framework will be really supportive. To, you know, they've taken a lot of the emphasis certainly on data. We, we do know that we we need to, to make sure that children achieve age related expectations and we do need to be challenging them and we do have to have high expectations and that's not something that we're shying away from. But the broad and balanced curriculum that Ofsted place the emphasis on now has replaced that emphasis on data, which is so welcome. And I do, I just hope that that continues to be the way forward. Um, it seems to be that education is ever changing, uh, but I'm hoping that this will now bring a bit of stability. Um, coupled with a little bit more money, um, it could be a, a really, really positive um, future for teachers you know, for teaching and for education in general. Um, it, it, the teaching profession is so committed. And I think with the number of teachers that are leaving the profession, we've got to really, really think about what's going to keep them here. And I do think a period of stability and that recognition for them doing such a, a fantastic job, doing it so well, that will help to retain our teaching workforce um, into the future. Um, so, you know, my wish is for a little bit of stability uh, to, to happen from now on um, and, and that recognition that we're getting from the Ofsted framework to continue for the next few years. Thank you. Okay, so last question then, nice and easy one. Um, what did you want to be when you grew up? Well, my parents were both teachers. So as a really young child, I wanted to be a nurse or a teacher. But then I began to try and fight against the urge to be a teacher. I was always very good at helping people um, and explaining things. But um, so I decided, um, and I think my family had also been stronger on the art side rather than the maths and science side. So I went with maths and science for A level and I decided I, I love and I did love learning about that. But then I decided I was going to be a police pathologist. And right before I needed to make a decision about, you know, applying to university and applying for what I was going to do after I left school, I decided no, I, I I stopped the fight and I thought, no, I'm going to go into teaching. So um, I fought against it most of my teenage life, but I think I always really did want to be a teacher. Thank you. Well, that's really nice. Thank you so much.